TJ, hello. Thank you for joining me on Canberra Conversations. And uh, that Lisbon Sun's doing you good. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Yeah, pleasure to be here. And for, for those that don't know, I guess you, you're speaking with an English accent. The English Andrew Huberman is, uh, as you're going to get christened on this podcast, but you've, uh, you've, recently, moved out to, you've recently moved out to, to Lisbon. How are you finding that? I'm loving it, man. I really am. I uh, quite fancied a bit of a change in my life. And yeah, I thought I'd go to a new city. Lisbon's pretty thriving in the whole like young entrepreneur tech stuff. So it's good fun. A lot of uh, meeting new people and socializing and doing fun stuff. So it's pretty cool. I guess to to bring us right up to modern day, then I'd love to know where your interest in what you're doing now started in terms of the, the human mind and psychology. When did when did that first start? Yeah, I think it started pretty early for me. I actually had OCD when I was young, when I was sort of like six years old to about nine years old. I had pretty serious OCD, which my mom did a fantastic job of getting me through some good guidance. And during that phase, I actually began playing a lot of golf and golf was kind of my original mission in life to become the next Tiger Woods. I haven't succeeded in that, but I like what I'm doing now. And the golf kind of channeled me in. But as I got more and more into the golf and I played like pretty high competitive level, a lot of sports psychology stuff started coming into it. So I started getting kind of interested in the psychology space. And then when I finished my GCSEs, I was trying to figure out what to study. And it seemed to me like probably the most interesting topic. So I started to do A level and do a degree in it. And that kind of got me really into the mix. Yeah, interesting, TJ. And uh, I'm a keen golfer away from the podcast and away from the the gym which takes up a lot of my time as well and I certainly think the psychological aspect of golf is one of the most underlooked particularly as a junior because I think you're a lot more volatile with all the different hormones and things that are going on from a, a puberty perspective so I can only imagine at that age you were like to, to actually perform at your best it's sometimes not just about your swing and your rhythm and your mm-hmm. your actual technical ability but also a lot about what's going on inside your your head a hundred percent it's just it's a lot of time in the quiet thinking about the annoying shot you just hit which like you just got to get good at calming down the brain calming the system down and it's just like a very high pressure sport and the fact that you can be playing amazing for three and a half hours and make one error towards the end and that costs you the whole thing so it definitely just made me pay close attention to my mind when i was young and i definitely think it was a a big factor in, in where i am now yeah, that's that, that's excellent. I think a lot of the high performers that I speak to on the podcast, they have a sporting background. So it's interesting that, albeit you now work in the in the mental space and you're supporting people with what's going on inside your head, you had that physical background that's probably led you to where you are now. Definitely, definitely. What do you think at the moment is seeing the big shift in the conversation around mental health? Because I've noticed that there's greater awareness than ever before, particularly in, in my age demographic. I, I've shown you before we hit record that I uh, am 29, I turned 30 this year. And when I was at school, there was no conversations around mental health. There was no conversations around well-being, really, in, in terms of those te- that terminology anyway. But I think there's been a massive shift recently in terms of at least we're talking about it now. What do you think has been driving that, TJ? I think there's like two sides to this. I think naturally humans are becoming like progressively more conscious and more aware and mental health has been a difficulty in society for a long time. And I think eventually it's now reaching a point where enough people are having a tough time in their head that it's warranting a lot of attention. So I think that's in a part of it, the awareness thing. But I really, really do believe that post COVID we're living in a a slightly new way, our relationship with things like our phones and social media and many different aspects of how we're living our life with hybrid work and everything like that. I think we're living in a way that isn't very conducive to feeling good in your head. And many, many more people are starting to not feel so good. So the attention is growing. I was very interested to see how you danced that one, because I, 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 like you think it's probably a combination of things where, like you said, the lifestyle that we live now, the modern always on, always contactable, always connected life. Surely that can't be good for us. And from an evolution perspective, I don't think we've quite caught up yet with uh, with everything that's going on in terms of what we've got access to. We certainly haven't. And our brain is telling us that, given it's so anxious and worried about so much stuff, because it's like, wow, it's a lot to take this modern world. And yeah, as I'm sure we're going to dive deep into evolution today, 
we're not quite living like a hunter gatherer anymore. We're uh, living like some kind of robotic species. So it's it's complicated for our our system. Yeah, this is this this is so true. And I think recognizing that we haven't changed as much as maybe we would want to have in terms of from an evolutionary perspective can be quite a challenging thing, particularly with a lot of the conversations we have around other topics when it comes to like um, adults and males, females and everything else. It's a very complicated world. But actually, if we look at like where we've come from, we are still quite primal in many, in many, many senses. And I guess the tech that we're exposed to is, is, is challenging us from that regard. But one of the kind of pieces of recent dialogue that I've seen that's been a little bit of a, a shock to the kind of mental health world, in my opinion, has been the kind of study that came out recently around chemical imbalances, because traditionally we've seen so much talk of um, like medication is used to address chemical imbar- imbalances, so antidepressant medication. What considerations do you think people need to take into account when it comes to conversations around medication? Because it's it's a very, very uh, sensitive topic. We've had people like Yuan Harry, who has uh, written Ross Connections and influenced a lot of young people, and uh, Fergus Crawley, who connected us. He's spoken quite passionately on the subject as well. But there seems there's a lot going on at the moment when it comes to things like chemical imbalances and whether people maybe perhaps need medication. I think it's good that this conversation is now getting attention because I think for a while we've just kind of been rolling with there's this chemical imbalance thing and medication is like the whole solution. And I have nothing against medication. I think medication can help many people. I think especially when you're in like a really low experience and you're looking for something to kind of alleviate you out of that pain so that you can get back to the kind of way of living that could be pretty good for the mind. Medication can be fantastic for those situations. The thing with chemical imbalance, it's slightly like off these terms because it's unlikely that someone just naturally has an imbalance in something like serotonin and it just happens to be low. It's much more likely that behaviorally they're getting a hell of a lot of stuff not quite right that's leading to just a reduction in the production of serotonin rather than it just being low on the whole. And then over time, there might become a chemical imbalance because it's just low so often. And we're seeing this with the dopamine, with all all the fast pleasure stuff. We're seeing it with serotonin, things like our diet and our relationship with nature and sunlight and breathing calmly. These things are so good for serotonin and how good are our diets and how connected are we to nature now? You can imagine the chemical is probably a little out of whack. And that probably speaks to the evolutionary component, which we've already touched on, where traditionally we would have maybe had not healthier, but less stressful on our minds in terms of our diets and our lifestyles so of course potentially we're going to be more susceptible to having low serotonin rather than necessarily being born or suddenly going through a period where our body stops producing serotonin in the same way maybe it's our our actions and our habits which have changed in terms of how we're kind of conforming I think it is that. And I don't mean to to disregard people that do have these imbalances because some people like can be born with really challenging situations. I've worked with a number of people that have had very tough experiences early on in life that can really shape how your mind operates. And in those situations, as I say, like these things can support you in alleviating yourself out of that. But I think it's so important that if you're someone that's thinking, oh, my mood is really low or I'm feeling anxious. First of all, there should be a, a full assessment behaviorally of how you're living your life see if adjustments can begin to support you. And then maybe the medication is required for a bit of support. But I think the medication being the sole answer will never be a solution for society. Yeah, and I think you're speaking to the right audience when it comes to that, because there's been a lot of talk of personal responsibility and understanding, like, how are my actions shaping what's going to come forward in, in the future? And my, my kind of one of my dream guests for the podcast would be James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits, which is massively about behavior change. And it's a very empowering message where I guess if you feel like you're entirely reliant on changing your life through a, a pill, it kind of feels a little bit like it's removed for you. But I actually very much appreciate how nuanced you give that answer when it comes to there are a number of individuals who will be in a situation where actually that will provide them the opportunity to move out of that particularly dark situation. And then they might be in the position to feel well enough to address habits, routines, situations that allow them to feel better beyond that again. So I think mm. there's there's so much nuance to that. And I guess that's why having longer form podcast conversations are more helpful sometimes than the short 15 second yeah. clips that we see on social media where of course you might come in for some trouble for saying that medication is not always the answer that people might shout at you because you've you've not been able to expand upon the level of detail you've just given me there uh, yeah it's very very true and i really hope like i know we're all smashing this tiktok and instagram reels and stuff 
But there is things like YouTube are still booming. Podcasts are rocketing, like video-based podcast stuff are rocketing. And I, I do think in this, in this pursuit of let's watch really fast stuff, I think we're birthing a real desire for longer form entertainment. And I think a lot of people are wanting that kind of thing. They're just looking for the right kind of thing to consume. So the situation of having these long form conversations, I think is wonderful. That's a really, really interesting point. And I've, since we've been connected, I've been consuming a lot of your stuff in terms of understanding like what impact and you being able to almost play the game in terms of, of course, you're sharing the short form content to get eyes on your content to help oh, people support them. Well, you have to, you have to, you have to play the game. Otherwise, otherwise you're shouting into a, a, a void and what's the point in that? Whereas, because you've got something to say that can help people. So you need to put it out there. And I'm the exact same when it comes to creating the podcast. I have to pick two or three clips from a 60 minute episode that go into TikTok, go into Reels, go into YouTube Shorts to get people to be like, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to go and listen to the full 60 minute conversation and get the full value. So you do have to, uh, I don't know. You have to you have to conform a little bit. You have to step into the matrix a little bit in order to get the to get people across to get the full value from the long term content. And I think there is a massive desire for it, as you said, to to expand on things because particularly people that listen to podcasts, they're curious. They're just mm. interested in more depth, more information. The people that follow you on Instagram will be like, "Do you know what? I'd really love to hear a little bit more from TJ about this topic. I've seen him talk mm. about this, and they'll they'll keep asking you in in DMs or story That is whatever. what my DMs are like, and I don't have the long form, but uh, it's in the works. I'm just uh, in the process of hiring a new videographer to help me with this stuff. So the long form, it's on its way. <laughs> it's coming. Excellent, TJ. And it, one of the the kind of key pieces of content that I've seen from you over the period has been around the dose formula what's that yeah so dose is this idea we have these four key neurotransmitters that are really inf- like they are our whole experience basically that we have in our mind you've got dopamine that's the big famous one oxytocin serotonin and endorphins very fortunately i realized on a walk about six months ago that it spells dose down the side which i'm sure other people have also noticed in this space but I suddenly realized, oh, maybe people could start kind of building their bespoke dose of behaviors that could be really good for their mental health. So, yeah, the formula is all about understanding the function of a chemical, what it looks like to be high or low in it, and then understanding what are the key behaviors that influence it. So you can kind of build a nice little formula for your head. You mentioned that dopamine is the kind of famous one. I think when I, I called you the English Andrew Huberman at the start, he's done a lot <laughs> of work to popularize a discussion around dopamine. And a lot of us now realize that our phones and some of our addictive behaviors are coming from dopamine, but I'd love to have a bit of a deeper discussion on it and just understand um, what what maybe are the, the symptoms of low or high dopamine and, and where does it come from and how can we manage it, TJ? Yeah, I honestly think understanding your dopamine is probably one of the most transformational things you can do for your life because it's impacting everything. It's impacting your mental health, your productivity with your work, your career, relationships. It's very significant this stuff so as always i kind of relate these things back to evolutionarily why do we have it because obviously it's there for a reason and we spent hundreds of thousands of years running around in those forests before we very recently have come up with this new model and our brain is designed for that and it's now just adapting to this so when you take a hunter gatherer for example the main function of dopamine is that it would come into their brain and it basically creates some desire some drive some motivation to do things that would keep them alive as a hunter gatherer. So it would motivate them to go out and hunt, to find food, to build shelter, to look after their kids. It would be like this driving energy. And a lot of the time people think of dopamine as like, it's just a rewarding feeling after something. That's not really how it functions. It's much more, it will come in and create a desire for something. And then it will continue to build as you're doing the thing. That's quite a lot of effort. So you're hunting down an animal. That's like a ridiculously hard thing to achieve. Dopamine's building. It's helping you to get into a state of focus. It's driving you up. And then you successfully like capture the animal or whatever it may be, dopamine surges. And this is the function of it. This is basically why we have it, just to motivate us to do things that are keeping us alive. And the really biggest thing to understand, first of all, before we go into symptoms and stuff, is living on this planet was really, really difficult. Staying alive was extremely difficult. To live through the cold weather and find food and like deal with all the danger around us, it was hard. And whatever you would call it, God, evolution, whatever put us here, whatever built us, basically had to make sure that they hardwired in, that doing things that were effort felt really good for us so that we'd do them, so we'd stay alive, continue to procreate and and have a society. And with that in mind, anything that's basically where you put in a load of effort and then you feel good afterwards is going to be building these dopamine bubbles in your brain. So when you take something simple in our world like exercise, 
when you start doing it, it's not like, oh, this is magic. I feel so much joy in this moment. But as you do it, you're like, that's pretty good. And then like gradually you pursue through it. It's like, oh, I feel quite good. I'm doing this. And afterwards you're like, nice, that's good. Satisfaction and accomplishment. That's a nice steady dopamine climb. What we've added in the last hundred years, very much so in the last few years, is the ability to get tons of pleasure. So the kind of end result of hunting down the animal, but with no prior climb in order to get there. So rather than dopamine going through these nice gentle curves, effort, put an effort, feel good, go back down. Now it's just, I'm here and then I'm up here, tons of dopamine. And the brain just suddenly thinks, what the hell am I doing up here? And it starts fluctuating like this in order to try and get to its nice level homeostasis balance number. So it's this fast pleasure stuff, quick pleasure, no effort. That's really messing and hijacking this system. I love that you've mentioned that it's an effort hormone and it's giving us reward during the effort. So like uh, I mentioned James Clear, I like to think about process-based goals rather than just outcome-based. So mm -hmm. by having that level of enjoyment and reward during the process, yes, the, the, the eventual achievement feels good and you get a reward from it, but you need to make sure that you've enjoyed the, the, the period on the way. And a lot of the time, when you're preparing for a big event or you're ready for something, you enjoy that more than when you actually get to it. So like, oh, right. um, hundred percent. yeah, it's, it, and, and, and that, and that's such a regular thing that you hear top level athletes or top level performers say, they're like, Oh, well actually like the high itself didn't feel as good as I thought it would because actually I enjoyed the journey along the way. So they enjoyed the victories in the, in the quarterfinal and the semifinal. And when the final came, of course it felt, felt amazing, but they also enjoyed the period during the final when they were working towards the actual win rather than just the feeling of touching the trophy. So I'm very, very glad that you, you brought that up. And um, I recently, uh, I've got more and more into my journaling over the last two and a half years, All TJ. Right. And the six minute diary that I use has little facts every Monday or, 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 or kind of prompts. And uh, one of the concepts it brought up was a German word, word called uh, Vorfreude. And it's basically the German word for joyful anticipation. And they shared an example that when you're joyfully anticipating like a good event or a good feeling or something that's going to happen, it increases your hormones by like 27%. So no, the example they gave that. was around, it's is good, isn't it? And the example they gave was around before watching a funny video. So if I say to you, oh, TJ, let me show you this funny video your hormones peak at 27% increase before you've even seen the video because you're anticipating how the video is going to make you feel and you mm -hmm. get like an enjoyment from that. So by like getting yourself excited and having something to look forward to, you also like raise yourself. And it's one of the mm -hmm. ways that some people can do that self-destructively, I'm sure, because you can maybe explain that when it comes to like addictions to things, maybe you're like looking forward to the substance at the end of the working day or the the, the the substances that you're going to have on the weekend after the working week because that's going to peak your dopamine so you're kind of keeping yourself going with a feeling of joyful anticipation beforehand so i find it fascinating when i hear these things and to talk about it with somebody like yourself is uh, is very enjoyable too i love it man oh so many interesting points in what you've shared there and this anticipation concept is very, very significant and what you're sharing about feeling good in the pursuit of something is actually really interesting because you can imagine it's always just so good to relate back to why do we have it and like one of the hardest things to possibly do was to get hold of food and like one of the most important if not the most important and the hardest moment in the food would be when you're absolutely exhausted and you've just got to push that extra like hour of hunting or whatever it was in order to get it so in that moment in the real hard pursuit is when we'd get these surges of dopamine so that we'd keep putting in the efforts that we'd make it and when you look at this concept, I always remind myself of this sentence that pleasure is in the pursuit, not necessarily in the outcome of what I'm seeking for. Because I noticed it in my own life, like I'll reach a certain amount of Instagram followers that I'd like to have. And it's like, wow, this feels really good. But almost the pursuit of getting there was feeling a lot more enjoyable. And when you look at athletes and actors and all these big people, like you mentioned, often people say that they get all the way to the top of their career and it's actually at the top of their career that they don't feel that good once they've achieved everything they're always dreaming of. Joe Wicks talks about this. He obviously boomed in COVID, became absolutely massive, international sensation, basically. And he talked on that Stephen Bart Bartlett pod about how he was standing in this amazing house in Richmond and just entered like quite a deep state of depression for a while because he'd like absolutely maxed his expectation of everything. And there's then no more pursuit. It's like, where do I go from here? And this is why lottery winners often get mental health problems, all this stuff, because we're just designed to constantly pursue. So 
with that in mind, with your anticipation idea, always thinking like, what am I in pursuit of? Whether it's a work thing, a career thing, a food goal, exercise, stronger relationships with your friends, anything. You just want to be in pursuit, basically. Yeah, there's got to be a carrot for us to to, to work towards. And, and uh, I suppose you've got to slightly enjoy the stick that you have to give yourself along the way to to, to, to make it there too. Um, the other yeah. thing I want to share with you regarding <laughs> dopamine, and this was a, an interesting thing. I've told this story in a couple of podcasts that I've been a guest on, but I'm regularly asked, like, when did you decide to start a podcast and why did you do it? And I've been a guest in 2019 on like five or six different podcasts, kind of talking about like, how do you fit your corporate career and sales career alongside like all your fitness stuff and stay in shape? And after each one, I was really enjoying it. I was sharing it with my audience on Instagram and they were saying, oh, Colin, like you should do your own podcast. Like that was really good. And I was like, okay, I definitely should. And in July, 2019, I told five or six people really close to me, like, I'm going to do a podcast and um, I'm going to start it. It's going to be called Canberra Conversations. I bought the mic. I bought a new MacBook because my old MacBook from uni was like crawling along like it was being powered yeah, by Amazon. A good a moment when the new Mac comes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I made some commitments to the process, TJ. Nice. And I made, I made, um, I wrote out 10 guests that were kind of within my network through Instagram and through my, my corporate job that I could have on. I didn't then start the podcast until april 2020 when we were locked inside for the first lockdown now the reason for that and i've come to understand is that when i told those five or six people that i was going to do my own podcast and i bought some of the equipment they gave me praise and they were like you'll be really good at the podcast call and i'm really looking forward to hearing it and that released a little bit of dopamine that gave me a little bit of satisfaction and it sedated me enough to not actually do the thing that was a little bit harder wow, and it giving me more effort so interesting and it sedated me. And then um, interestingly, do you know Chris Williamson, the host of Modern Wisdom? Yeah. So Chris shared in one of his newsletters that it's actually really helpful to be around people who do the thing rather than say they're going to do the thing because there is an element of you share your ideas with each other. And if you both kind of never do them, you're both sort of like gratuitously giving yourself like a little bit of dopamine and a kind of positive hormones about just your ideas rather than the action. And I found mm. it fascinating that I managed to, as somebody that's quite an action taker and quite relentless when he gets into his habits, that I managed to stop myself from like taking action because I was kind of getting enough of a benefit and enough of a positive feedback loop from other people before even doing the thing. Wow, that is very interesting. I have seen uh, something kind of like that about how sharing, the idea of actually sharing the goals does provide a dopamine experience, like telling people what you're going to do effectively. So what did you find was the solution in that situation to then getting yourself to just knuckle down? What what did get I, the driver? Well, because we'd been locked in, I think the first 10 week lockdown was like the strictest, wasn't it? In terms of like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you like, can't really do yeah, anything. Yeah. Or whatever. So, it felt pretty serious. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't, I couldn't go to the gym. Okay. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't go to work in my suit and talk about big deals and try and do things. Everything moved remotely. So mm. by that, those aspects of my identity and my habits being removed from me, I had extra bandwidth to do something. So I guess like my capacity in terms of like the amount of energy that I had, say it's got hundred units. It used to be like fully stretched and I didn't really have the room for the podcast. And oh, I, I, that's a lie. I probably did, but I would have had to drop something a little bit down. Whereas I suppose when you lose like all your travel time to work, you lose the fact that you're going out to meetings, you lose the fact that you're going to the gym and getting a full kind of more exciting workout than when I was using resistance bands and a kettlebell in my living room. I had extra bandwidth available. So I kind of turned myself to be like, right, I'm going to put my energy into this. And I guess I put my effort into it and I saw the reward immediately. And when I start something, I tend to keep going because I respond really well to the dopamine movie, uh, TJ. Nice. Interesting. Good effort. And now you've made, did you say a hundred episodes earlier? <laughs> Yeah, um, this episode will come out, I think it'll be, this will be 149, so 149 right. by the time this comes out, yeah. So yeah, I've, I've really committed to the process. It's been- You're in the pursuit. It's been really warm. <laughs> exactly that pr pursuit. So yeah, there's I'm getting pleasure because I'm in the pursuit. I love that line from you as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a big, big fan. But let's move on to the the O and Dose, DJ, Ox mm -hmm. oxytocin. Oxytocin, this is, a, this is a big one. This is the uh, hormone and neurotransmitter that lives within us that guides us to basically bond and have social connection and have relationships. And I think some people, it's not as popular in terms of how many people know it, but it's still known oxytocin. And 
the biggest thing, the biggest function, the most predominant experience we have of it as a human is when a mother gives birth, both the baby and the mom experience this huge surge in oxytocin in order to create an initial maternal bond. And then the process of the breastfeeding, very significant for oxytocin, all of the kind of physical touch and hugging and love, all of this stuff begins to create oxytocin in us. And when you look at it in our modern world, we just really want good quality deep conversation time where we're physically connecting with each other like in COVID the whole elbow thing like that just didn't work for us as a species because it was so confusing and I even think post COVID we're a little bit awkward with how we engage and interact with each other because of like we've just like reset how we do this sort of stuff and we want to physically give each other love we want to like high five and hug each other and all of these different things and yeah, I think I know you mentioned lots of your audience are like men and stuff like that were in, interested in mental health and performance and things. I think in the male space, oxytocin is very interesting because a huge part of it, as I say, is, is good quality, like in-depth conversation. And one of the, the greatest ways to stimulate this oxytocin is by being vulnerable in a conversation and by sharing. And I'm sure many people have experienced this. I think lots of ex people experience this when they have some form of therapy or counseling, which I think is awesome, by the way. I think it's so good if you seek out and have conversations with people. I've had tons of conversations with people and they've helped me a lot in my life. And sometimes in those, if you are someone that's experienced it, or maybe just think to a conversation you've had with your mom or your brother or something where you've just shared a bit, the experience of vulnerability, even though you're maybe sharing something that's a bit painful or something that's a worry of yours, can be quite a cathartic experience. And you can always feel this relief as you begin to share. And you can feel this love as you bond with the person that you're sharing with. And I think when we're looking at men's minds and men having quite a tough time in their head, developing this capacity to find whoever it is in your life, whether therapy or counseling or a mate or a dad or a mom, where you just think, I actually am just going to be myself and share what's in my mind. That is heaven for this chemical. Yeah, that's such a good example um, for me, TJ. And it, it really speaks to me because as you said, like, um, I've actually interviewed a gentleman called um, Adam Lane Smith, who's an attachment specialist. And he was right. talking about oxytocin as one of the ways that females actually bond to males in terms of romantically. Definitely. And, and men typically bond a little bit more through vasopressin. So like coming through challenges or shared adversity. Yeah. And I completely understand what you're saying when it comes to oxytocin in terms of bonding men or at least giving men a positive feeling with other men. And it's through sharing the fact that oh, well, this is happening for me at the moment. I need to tell you about this. And by being open and vulnerable, you build a deeper connection with somebody that you've like trusted with like potentially what's a little bit of a secret as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I think the, the vasopressin oxytocin comparison is very cool as well. I definitely think there are small alterations that take place between these. But when you look at this, and this isn't obviously just for men, just any, any opportunity to really deeply connect is important. And I'm always in my mind just trying to figure out like, why now is this happening? Why is mental health in such difficulty? And you look at this neurotransmitter, you think we really want to be super, super connected. And how much is our modern world actually not enabling that to happen? Like even when I go to restaurants and I go socialize, there's so many people are on their phone in those social situations. And lots of my mates like even talk about it. So like, I don't even know why I'm on it, but I'm just on it because it's like, you just check, we just check all this stuff so much, check the stories and constantly are not in the experience we're actually having. And then you have hybrid work and a lot of like isolation with the homeworking. And it just needs to be such a priority in our life to be in person connecting with humans with no phones around. And I experienced, I came out to Lisbon and it can all look amazing on an Instagram story. Oh, look at all these nice things he's getting up to. And I'm in my YouTube video that's coming out, I talk pretty openly about this stuff. But in my first few weeks, it wasn't like an amazing experience. I had no friends out here. I came out here knowing zero people. And I was just not feeling that good. I wasn't connecting with people. I didn't know what the process was in order to make friends in a situation where you're in a new city you don't know. And I was thinking, oh, I feel quite crap. And I looked at my screen time on my phone and it was so much higher than it normally is. And I think I was really seeking for human connection. And then often in the, in the pursuit of, oh, I really want to connect with people, it's then, well, I'll just slightly satisfy that with Instagram. And like you're, you're just underwhelming yourself effectively. That's then, so powerful, TJ. I wasn't like, feeling that great. Yeah, that's so powerful because yeah, yeah. one, one that's you've been vulnerable with me in the audience, but two, I completely can see how you evolutionary, your brain's like, I've got access to this tool that will get me some form of connection and it will have to do for now because I'm a little bit lonely. I'll 
the online connection will do for now. But really, that's a sticking plaster because what you really need is connection in person with the people that are in your new city that you're, you've just moved to. Yeah, I, I actually, I've been thinking about it a lot of situation because the story has a more positive finish, which is joyful that I get to share that. But I was thinking about this and I don't even think it's not, it's not even just it's a sticking plaster and providing you with something. I actually think it's making it significantly, significantly worse because you're then just watching people socialize and have fun whilst you're not doing it. So it's like a extra stab in the stomach because it's like, being at school and being forced to like be on the playground and everyone's having fun and doing games and you've got to sit on the wall and watch which i did get in trouble at school occasionally and had to sit and watch everyone have fun and that wasn't an enjoyable experience and then i discovered this app called meetup when i was out here which is like if you don't know it, this is obviously not a marketing campaign but it's like an app where people are doing all kinds of fun stuff like meeting up and all kinds of shit that people are interested in and I saw one that was like a breathwork event in this forest. And it was literally one afternoon on a Friday. And I was like, oh, I'm not, just, I, want, I want to be with people. I want to talk to people. Went to it. And then like it transformed my trip. Like I met a load of people there. I went for dinner and then met some friends. And then that's just spiraled into me having like a load of new connection in my life out here. And the difference in my mind of having good quality social connection in person, chatting to people, listening, all this stuff to where I was. And really all, all my other habits were pretty solid during that time was so significant. So it's just, if that isn't a big thing in your life, being with people and not only being with them like when you're pissed and stuff, but just being with people, it's gotta be there. Quality of connection too. I think that's vital because there's always like, it's very easy to have those like low quality, um, high frequency interactions that don't really mean anything. But you've spoken there when it comes to like the release of oxytocin, it needs to be like a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of closeness, a little bit of touching, like um, actual genuine in-depth connection. And that's what's made you feel happier. And I love the fact that you've just said like, my other habits were pretty solid. So like, this was definitely the thing that was missing. And when yeah. it's added in, you see the improvement straight away. So like, it, it's the same mm. as like some, somebody starts taking some particular supplement um, and they're like, oh, I've gained like all this lean muscle, but actually it turns out they've been sleeping for eight hours a night and, <laughs> and actually tracking their calories. So there's been more to it. Whereas for you, you were like, everything else was kind of level and consistent. And then this got added in and I was spending more time with people. I was feeling more connected. We were having physical intimacy and feeling like like this is actually my friend group now mm -hmm. I, I, I absolutely love that uh, tj and the the, the s and dose is serotonin and we kind of hinted a little bit of serotonin already when we've spoken about like use of um uh, antidepressant medication for dealing with imbalances but tell me a bit more about serotonin yeah serotonin is fascinating it's arguably my favorite if you're allowed to have a favorite i don't know if it works like that but uh I just, the behaviors that interact with serotonin, I, I particularly love doing. So what's interesting about this one is all of the, the other three, and we'll come to the final one, are created in the hypothalamus near your pituitary gland, which is, which is like deep in here in the center of your brain, basically. If you imagine right into the middle of there, that's where these chemicals are being built. And 5% of your serotonin is built in there like the others, but 95% of it is built inside here, inside your whole digestive tract. So it does have a very different relationship to the other three. And it's super connected, therefore, to things like our gut health because of our whole microbiome. Like you can imagine if this serotonin stuff builds inside your gut, then if good food, nutritious stuff turns up, it's going to be like, well, that's pretty useful as a building block in order to make this stuff. And similarly, in the other side of it, when we eat loads of crap food, it's going to be not very useful because it's got to focus on that. And in terms of its function, this one is all about our mood and our emotional state. And it's kind of the neurotransmitter that's constantly communicating. How is the body right now? What's the vibe of the body? How is it doing? And it's communicating that information to the brain. And there's a super cool mechanism called the vagus nerve. I don't know if you've come across the vagus nerve, but it's basically we have a number of key nerve cells that will move from the spinal cord up into the brain. They'll go into the eyes, the nose, the mouth. And then we have one main cord that will go down and that's called the vagus nerve. And it basically will come down from your spinal cord. It connects into our throat, into our chest, and then into our abdomen and stomach and stuff like that. And it's basically what's entirely responsible for your nervous system. So when some stress takes place and we have all these concepts like cortisol and adrenaline and stuff, it's the vagus nerve that basically tells the brain what's going on. So when you have all this serotonin in your tummy, it's the vagus nerve that's chatting back and forth. And yeah, this one is basically all about how do I make the body as happy as it can possibly be? And then the body is going to make the mind happy as a result. Yeah, there's that whole phrase, uh, the, the gut is the second brain. 
Yeah. And I get and I guess that that physiology that you've explained there and psychology explains why that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um what have you done to experiment with your own gut health and TJ to support your serotonin? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've been on quite a journey with what foods go into my body, if I'm honest. I'm in general, I'm extremely experimental. I'm experimental with everything basically that's available. And now I'm deducing quite a healthy way of living. But when we look at food, I've done three years as a very disciplined vegan, which came to an end in about February this year, which is interesting. I thought the vegan thing was cool. I think if people are doing that, then that's cool. But I did just think my gut wasn't that good when I was in the vegan thing. I didn't think it was functioning that well. I think the fake meats weren't really that great. So I decided to add back a uh, some good grass-fed red meat like two or three times a week and then added back eggs. Eggs have been unbelievable to add back. They just feel right to be putting in my body. Uh, added back some fish. So these are the kind of main products. And then in terms of making my gut good, I think a lot about fibrous foods. So fibrous foods, if you imagine like a if you imagine like an oat, for example, before you've cooked it, it's super textured, you know, it's that textured feeling. The way that fiber interacts differently to all the other foods is as food goes into our mouth, we have all these things like amylase and stuff that begin to break it into a liquid. And food gets pretty much liquefied as it goes through the body. And fiber doesn't, basically. Fiber actually pre- remains pretty textured. So it's very, very cleansing to the bowel. So things like pulses for protein, things like pulses, kidney beans, chickpeas, butter beans, all that stuff, I make a big priority for my gut. I think a lot about fruit. I eat a lot more fruit than I used to. And I find fruit very, very interconnected with my mood when I snack on fruit. And in general, when I eat large plates of food, I typically see a rise in my mood. Uh, I think I drink that kombucha stuff, which is like that fermented green tea stuff. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, But yeah, there are a few things I do for the gut. Interestingly, when you were talking about transitioning away from the vegan diet, one of the things you transitioned away from within the vegan diet was probably the processed foods. So the meats Mm -hmm. that were heavily processed, because in order to achieve what they're trying to achieve with uh, a vegan meat, they have to add a lot in. Whereas when you were saying, oh, grass-fed beef, um, uh, eggs, so again, very natural, and then fish, very natural as well. And that probably translates to happy gut as well and uh, for those that are watching on youtube they'll see that i'm wearing a, a my protein t-shirt and i do a lot of work with my protein i promote the, the the supplementation and the 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 protein bars and stuff like that as well however i do know that my gut health is an awful lot better when i minimize to a very 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 low level indeed like irregular protein bars and things like that as well because they quite often have a lot of different synthetic fake sugars in them to replace the fact that they don't want them to be super high calorie And that can cause like disruption to my gut, but also to my mood as well. And I know that from previous interviews, a a lady called Evie Chardon, she had like significant inflammation over the years and going to a less processed diet, she found that her body was an awful lot less inflamed from that perspective. And I guess inflammation physically in the body, best believe that's causing problems with your head as well. Definitely. Definitely. And the brain inflames as well, just as the gut does. And they're so interconnected that if one inflames, the other one responds. So I think it, I think it's interesting. Like I went through a big journey with this. Honestly, I was, I was a vegan vegan (laughs) and I wanted everyone else to be a vegan. I never posted about it online, but I uh, really believe in it. And then I, I was, I teach so much about how do we get towards like a natural optimal way of living. And I was thinking, this isn't the diet. This isn't what we were eating back then and i just thought i've got to try i've got to see what it's like to have these products and everything is just functioning so much better my energy is so much better my mind is clearer just yeah feel pretty good i think one of the reasons that we get on during this conversation but even in the build-up to getting organized was you are very open to like doing things that you said you're going to do and like and like making sure that everything's on point but also like you're you're clearly very open-minded to like oh well like this is how i want to live and actually that's not in alignment tj like i need to make this change and then you make the change and mm. and, and 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 you commit to it and i think that's the reason like you've built like the online following you've got but also the connection you've probably got with the people that do follow you they're like oh well, tj is like living quite intentionally and in line with what he said he's going to do as well and open to be like i was doing this found it wasn't right and or it wasn't working for me i'm going to change to do this yeah for sure and i honestly i love the the journey of experimentation because I just absolutely love feeling good in my head. There's just, I mean, I'm sure everyone does, but like there's just nothing I seek for more than to be in that state where I feel driven and focused and excited and connected. And 
Therefore, I'm willing to basically try whatever there is on offer that I find out about online or that I like intuitively think about. And I think approaching a much more experimental mentality to your own mental health is really important because you can just begin to think rather than, oh, maybe that'll work. I read that in a book, saw that in a podcast. Just start trying loads of this stuff and really getting good at paying attention and observing what kind of stuff does help. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the E in dose is endorphins, TJ. Take it away. Yeah, so endorphins. Interesting, like kind of different to the other three in a way in the fact that all of the other ones are taking you upward towards something. They're giving you more motivation and more drive with the dopamine. They're increasing your connection and your bond with oxytocin. They're boosting your mood and your emotional state with the serotonin. This one is taking stuff away. And what it's taking away is psychological and physiological pain, basically. So when you are in a situation like as we know these are all adapted for a reason to keep us alive and when we're in some kind of life-threatening situation and say for example i am faced with i don't know fighting a bear that's a terrible example i would have no chance i just lose so the endorphin system would be pointless say i'm fighting the bear's little child and i'm interacting the bear and that bear scratches me the function of the endorphin system is to release throughout the hypothalamus and into the bloodstream so that it really just takes away the pain that you're experiencing in order to you in order to optimize your chance of survival and something like morphine for example which we have in medicine and in like significant injuries and stuff like that that's very much built upon our understanding of this endorphin system it's like our natural pain reliever and although it was all about physiological pain really back in the day like we were experiencing so much physiological pain now we've got a lot of psychological pain going on and regardless of either one the endorphin release is going to provide a huge relief to a lot of the pain we go through. Yeah, completely compl understand. It's like um, it's masking some of the pain so that you give yourself the best chance of survival. How is it adapted over the years then? Because obviously you've given the example there, like that would have been very hunter-gatherer, wouldn't it? Like if we were under attack and I was injured, I'm able to push through that for a little bit to ensure my survival and my my, my the carrying on of my lineage. But how, how is that kind of adapted to the modern day when it comes to endorphins, TJ? Yeah. So if you imagine it in that model, it's basically the body is in significant difficulty. So I'm going to respond by putting some endorphins in because I can see they're in some kind of pain. And with that, it's just anything that will really, really get the body going is going to release this. So exercise is fantastic. Exercise actually interacts with the dopamine. It gives us drive and motivation and it interacts with serotonin. It affects our mood massively. But the exercise where you really push, so you're cycling up a hill as fast as you can, you're running as fast as you can, you're in the last few reps in the gym, the moments where you really exert the body and it goes into pain is when the endorphin system releases, which is why whenever you really go for it when you exercise, you feel the best because the endorphin system releases in those moments. So anything now that really exerts us, something like a sauna, for example, like you're sitting there and you're like, this is literally painful. Like if you, I always try and reach 15 minutes in a sauna. And when you're at about seven, you're thinking, get me out of here immediately. And I always sit there telling myself, like the pain is good. The pain is good in here because the endorphin system is going to have to kick in to help me out with this situation. So anything that really pushes you is going to be good. Cold showers are uh, the opposite of saunas, I guess, and very, very popular. And I imagine you advocate those as well. Does that interact with endorphins or is that more dopamine? Yeah, the cold shower is interesting. It, you definitely would get an endorphin release. The endorphins would, would have a function, but cold showers are more associated with the dopamine because when you, the dopamine system is actually what creates adrenaline. It's the precursor to adrenaline. So in order for adrenaline to surge in your body, first dopamine has to spike. And you can imagine evolutionarily the reason being that Dopamine, totally responsible for drive and focus. So in your, if you're in a situation where you suddenly needed a ton of energy because you're under threat, you need a hell of a lot of attention and drive. So dopamine surges, then adrenaline surges. And cold water immersion, like your body is suddenly like, what the hell is this cold water doing? Like, am I in some kind of danger? Like if you're running away from an animal and then suddenly you're in a lake, you need a lot of dopamine. So dopamine a little bit more with the cold showers, which is why from a productivity and motivation point of view the cold water in the morning before work is just bliss for our brains what's your protocol for it then tj what what happens when you get in the shower 
Yeah, so I don't like taking cold showers and I want to take them and I do take them every day. But my, I'm not someone that's like, oh, it's so enjoyable just having cold water hit my body. So my protocol has been, I was actually annoyed when I discovered they were good for me because I was like, oh, now I've got to get into this as well. But, you were uh, looking for some research that would give you a confirmation bias to say they're okay for you, like you don't really need to do them. Honestly, that's what I would have liked to see. But then I found out about that. There's a study in Prague that found that it can do a, it can result in a 250% rise in your dopamine, like it can 2.58 your dopamine, which is the same as what cocaine can do, which, and, and a lot longer lasting than a quick spike of cocaine. So I was going to say, I, I've, I've read about cocaine before when it's come to dopamine. It's something like it only lasts for like between nine to 11 minutes or something stupid yeah. like that. Whereas so coke is spike and fall, and this can be two and a half hours. So it's a different game. Um, well, so my protocol is have my shower, have my nice warm shower, and I'm happy doing that experience. And then actually prior to this, I really like listening to music in the shower. That's just like gets me in a good vibe. Music also interacts with both endorphins and dopamine. And normally I'll put on like a song that I particularly like. And then once I've done my normal shower washing stuff, when the song hits a bit that I really like, like a bit of a chorus or something, then I'll go to the cold and I'll just like take the deep breaths, move around. Like I almost like continue to wash myself in the cold water. I always think the cold water is really good for your skin and your hair and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of just move around a bit, take deep breaths and just continue to tell myself that, that pleasure is in pain. And that's just like a fact. Things that are painful really do skyrocket the dopamine system. And I'll always aim for like a minimum of 30 seconds. And then I like to get up towards like 60 seconds to maybe 90 seconds of, of standing there. And it's something that once you start doing it a lot, you realize how significant it is to your energy system. And then it just kind of begins to maintain. Yeah, there's rewards uh, from the effort, which we've we, 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 we've hinted at already throughout this. So that, no, very, very interesting in terms of the, the practical implementation of it as well. I guess on dopamine, one of the big things that was sitting in my head that I wanted to ask you about was around dopamine detoxes. Have mm -hmm. you seen any benefits or any evidence that suggests that we should uh, detox at times? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a variety of models of a dopamine detox. So there are proper, proper dopamine detoxes where people sit on their sofa for two days and don't have any stimulation and like have nothing, which I mean, fair play. It's going to do some sort of reset to that dopamine system. But I think often for the mass, it's very unrealistic. So I think there should definitely be windows in our day every day on a consistent basis where no, where we receive no dopamine. So I, for example, or at least none of this, none of this fast pleasure dopamine, which would be alcohol, junk food, porn, social media, or like vaping and drugs, that kind of stuff. So those five would be your, your big five that'd be fast pleasure. And to know that you're needing a dopamine detox is what, if you're in that like lethargic, low focus, low drive state where you're just really not that excited about your experience of life, you're, you're really low in dopamine. And that's a cue to think, okay, I need to get away from the dopamine. It's often in that stage that we seek for it because we're low on it and we think, oh, quick spikes will get me out of this. So it's often when we're feeling really crap, like for example, when you're hungover, you're super low in dopamine. And those are the days that typically a lot more porn and social media and junk food t tends to take place. TJ, uh, that's huge. I know you were saying about your screen time being higher when you moved to Lisbon, you were feeling alone. I, I was telling you before we hit record, I had two and a half years with, without any alcohol at all on my first hangover my screen time must have been about five and a half six hours and i am never <laughs> anywhere near that and it, it was because i just want to feel better i was reaching for the mm -hmm. cheap easily available stuff to feel better so it stri really strikes a chord to me it's interesting as well because and i experienced all of this stuff i've been like a big drinker I've, I've done all of the stuff like i've lowered the dopamine as low as it can go it's probably one of the reasons i'm in this space and you imagine you have like dopamine is constantly regenerating, but it's not like an infinite source. Like you, you build a certain amount and then there's like a nice amount there and then you can use it up effectively. So you imagine in your head, you've almost got like a bucket of these dopamine bubbles sitting there. And say you do something like you go out and you get super pissed and you use a load of it up. It's like, wow, it's really fun. No, I like lots of pleasure, excitement, da, 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 da. but you do use a load of it up. So you're very low on the resource the next day. And then you're thinking, oh, I feel like crap. So I'm going to go for more of this cheap dopamine. But all you're doing is like taking every last little drop of it out of there. So then your recovery time is much, much longer. And a lot of people don't feel that good on Mondays and Tuesdays. And I don't think they realize necessarily it's how much of the alcohol. And then also the other dopamine behaviors on the weekend, like the porn and like the social media, that are having a, a big impact. So in answer to your question around the detox, I think 
First thing in the morning, you really don't want fast, cheap dopamine because throughout the night, your body's gone through a restorative process of building dopamine. You can imagine the hunter-gatherer wants to wake up with drive and focus to get going with the day. So your brain is sitting there, it wakes up, it's like, nice, I've got some dopamine, even though it may not feel like that, it does have it there. And then typically it strains the social media and then the dopamine's going down. So I like to think of my morning as a bit of a dopamine detox, definitely from the fast dopamine. So like waking up and I'll always splash some cold water on my face. That's a really good thing to do. I'll go to the bathroom. I always used to hammer a nice morning scroll while sitting on the toilet. So I now have a book by the toilet, which I'll read a few pages of, which is much better for your dopamine system. I'll brush my teeth and then I'll head outside and I'll kind of go for a little walk, do some press ups, that kind of stuff that I like doing. So a dopamine detox in the morning is great. And similarly, any time in the day that you can find this at lunch, can you just get away from social media, away from crap food? Can you do this in the evening? On the weekends, if you can leave your phone behind and go for like a, a walk for an hour and a half with your mate that is just bliss for this dopamine system because it gives it this opportunity to restore where the phone is so difficult is it differs from all the other addictive stuff because at least we don't have them all the time we don't drink all the time or some people may but we don't drink all the time we don't eat crap all the time but the phone can be this constant depleter which really tires our dopamine system out so getting windows away from it really really key intermittent fasting for your phone is one of the life hacks that uh i actually spoke to chris williamson about who's who was actually the launch episode for this podcast really really good guy and he is huge on like that gap in the morning as well because like you say you used to scroll on the toilet when you woke up first thing whereas you've swapped that for a book and i know that books tend to have like quite a positive impact on your dopamine because again there's a little yeah. bit of effort to, to to read them i suppose especially in this environment where we're so used to like something quick and fast paced a book's a lot slower more measured so it must interact differently with our heads definitely you have to earn the joy from the book it doesn't it's just not given to you and all we're designed to do is earn joy and not have it given to us so like a book is a real like classic example of this because it requires all your attention like how many times have you got to the bottom of a page gone to turn over and thought nope i haven't even got a word from that page even though you did kind of read it you just didn't have 100% focus. And we struggle with 100% focus now. But something like that, when you do read a few pages of a book, and I don't put any demands on myself here. I literally read a page, page and a half, and that's enough for me because our attention span is broken. And that will still mean that dopamine is climbing. It's something I've put a bit of effort into. So it's very good. I love hearing about people's morning routines, particularly ones where you're trying to optimize for all the different chemicals in the in 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 the head from a neuroscientific perspective. Um, how else is that setting you up for the day then in terms of the different things that are going on? We've spoken about there in terms of it's a dopamine detox, but um you said you do some press ups, you're getting outside, you're seeing sunlight, or well, sunlight in Lisbon, maybe not always in Glasgow where I'm recording from, <laughs> TJ. But uh but what what else is this morning routine doing to the chemicals in your head? Yeah, so Definitely, I'm thinking in my head, how am I surging this dopamine, like the nice, natural, hard, hard to earn dopamine so that I'm getting my drive and focus up for the day. So they've got the, the cold water splashing in the face, the reading, getting outside in the sunlight. Um, you mentioned Andrew Huberman, like one of his biggest things he talks about is having this natural light wake us up. And it's something I never really thought about. And then I started doing, I started like kind of waking up. It's a good way to get away from the phone. I go out for a walk and wander around and let let my brain wake up in that environment and your eyes like optimize it helps all the whole sleep so sleep wake cycle circadian rhythm and so the the sunlight very significant i then like to do some exercise when i'm out there me and my brother are currently in this long-standing competition of who will be the first and not do 100 press-ups a day so we are just every morning i have to go and do 100 press-ups and i'm extremely competitive and so is he so we will be continuing until we die but uh, so I have to do my 100 press ups. And I really like to normally if I go on these walks, I'd go in my Birkenstocks and then have my bare feet on the grass in the morning. That's something really significant to me. I really believe in the earth connection, like uh, that whole grounding earth in concept. So, yeah, Can those I ask on, a, on, a, on a practical perspective, um, I mentioned there um, this podcast will come out in right at the start of October. So the mornings will start to get a little bit darker. Do yeah. you have a suggestion for what we can look at to get some light if we're not able to get that really strong natural light? So say I'm getting up at six, half past six. Mm -hmm. I normally am out for my walk by like the back of seven. How can I try and like get this this benefit if, I, if I'm not getting as much natural light? Yeah, it's a good question. So 
I really, really think the sunrise alarm clocks are extremely good. I don't know if you've come across them, but they wake you with like a, a light over a 30 minute period. So things like Lumi and stuff, if you just search sunrise alarm clock on Google, you'll be able to find them. They wake you with a, a nice light over 30 minutes. So those are very good instead of waking up to an alarm. Sleeping with your curtains open. So at least whatever light is coming and not fully open, but like a bit open is very good. And then if it is that you have to, you have to start. I mean, it shouldn't be. You got to get outside for like a few minutes. I just can't say not to do that. But e even if it was still dark, just like a few minutes for your body just to like be in the outdoor environment before you sit at a desk. But then to actually get the light, I would say doing your first like hour, hour and a half of work, and then stepping outside, like going to, if you're in a in the city, like going for a walk for a bit, whatever it may be. But uh, yeah, sunrise alarm clock, I'd say, would be best. Yeah, I think that answers the the light like, query. And like you say, like I, I'm I'm still going to be going outside to do my walk. I tend to try and get a, a good portion of my steps for the day at the start of the day before I'm kind of disturbed. And yeah. I love the fact that you're talking about your tech. Now, I'm a little bit anal when it comes to like details and tracking things. Actually, Fergus <laughs> introduced us when I was on his podcast. I was speaking a lot about that kind of control element of my lifestyle where I like to have the data to manage decisions. So I track my steps that I'm doing in the morning, across the day, across the week, and I can make decisions based on that in terms of my calorie intake, my training, all that kind of nonsense, okay? But I try and have the podcast I'm going to listen to when I'm outside pre-downloaded because it means that my phone can go in my pocket, ideally in my hoodie pocket or in my short pocket and zipped up, meaning that I shouldn't interact with it and I should just have it playing through my AirPods, meaning that I'm not tempted to like go on whatsapp and deal with uh, instagram dms or go on emails and maybe work emails or even personal emails for the things like the podcast and little interaction with tech as possible is perfect like in an ideal situation my data is not on until like i'm home for like eight o'clock and i'm like ready to then start my day and i've not kind of i've not had outside influence apart from a select a pre-selected podcast which i think is going to help me because at that time in the morning as well i'm super primed to like learn and take things on and feel like set up for my working day as well yeah i think i think that's a very cool process and i think what you're sharing is very important like we really want our brain and body to decide in the morning how how it feels about its nervous system and its stress and its anxieties and its worries and its good feelings and stuff before the phone decides for us and there's just so much information on that phone something can stress you out in your whatsapp your email your bank account anything and you want to be in a nice stable position before you see that stuff. And our brains are just adapted to wake up in a super vulnerable state. You can imagine back in the jungle, it's super useful. If any noise can take place, anything, our brain can just adapt and move in any direction so that we can adapt situations. So they wake up and you can imagine the brain, it doesn't actually work on this, but it's almost like more squishy than normal and it will go wherever it's guided to go. So if it goes to a nice, calm nature environment for a walk and settles down, has some time to think, things like gratitude, very significant. I do that on my walk. And then it can stabilize. If it's just wake up, super malleable, and then bang, here's the whole world in your face. You're just like, you're rolling the dice on whether you're going to feel good. Yeah, absolutely. Based on the time that we've still got left available, TJ, I, I wanted to ask about optimal productivity and happiness in your work environment, because I know you work with a lot of corporates now. What does that look like for you? Yeah, productivity is something I'm very interested in, for sure. I'm always trying to figure out a way to optimize this. I'm actually living with a, a new chap at the moment in Lisbon who's pretty good at this techie stuff and he set me up on a bit of a new productivity system which pure dopamine for my brain very exciting so yeah I think having a good way in which you're organizing what your workflow looks like with what your week looks like is really significant like having giant task lists I just think leads to overwhelm and procrastination so I think Having like some way, I'm using this thing called Sunsoma. I also use Notion or like an, an Apple reminder system. But having some way in which you can see your week and see the task, so you're not getting too overwhelmed by all that you're trying to achieve, I think is very good. And then really most importantly is figuring out how are you actually going to get into deep states of focus when you're working? Because we as humans can be crazy productive if we need to be. Like you, you see it when you have a real time pressure on something to be put in like people have this when they're going through university and exams and we have it in our working lives as well when the time pressure really hits then you're like well i can get rid of that phone and i can get something done pretty bloody efficiently but normally it's like oh i'm just kind of going to kind of gradually get through this stuff so figuring out a way for me doing things like always making sure my phone isn't on my desk when i'm working super significant because when a task either gets boring or difficult you're going to go for it so no phone on the desk 
getting selective over kind of how long you think a task will take, I think is, is really cool because I think a lot of the time we assign too much time to things and they can be done faster. So really trying to optimize how the hell am I going to get away from distraction, turning off all the like comms apps, Slack and Teams and email, all this stuff. You want to get it gone, enter deep focus, do a task, then go and chat to people and then come back and forth rather than the constant movement. Yeah, massive on environment design as well. And I hosted Nir Eyal on the podcast, who was the author of Indistractable. And he has a very similar approach when it comes to not just endless to-do lists. He, he's very much like time boxing. So allocating between 9 and 10, this task will happen. Between 10 and 10.30, this task will happen. And like you say, if you assign too much time to the task, then best believe the work will expand to the, mm-hmm. to the, the time that you've made available to it as well. But the interesting thing that he also spoke about was internal triggers. So understanding like, why you reach for your phone and you've hinted at that there when you reach a little bit of inertia like you're not sure what to type next in this email or you're not sure what to put next in this presentation or you're not sure um quite how to do this calculation if you're if you're in a a kind of more mathematical field then you will reach for something that will alleviate that pain as quickly as possible and that might be some cheap dopamine from even like linkedin for me that's the big thing i'm guilty of like i'll reach for linkedin because it feels like work doesn't it for me like, oh, I'll go and connect with the decision maker on LinkedIn rather than write this presentation when I know the real value lies in doing that and I'm doing that to escape from the discomfort of not being sure what to put next, DJ. So I love that you've spoken to those different aspects uh, when it comes to productivity and uh, kind of optimal performance. Yeah, you got to just try and get good at fighting that that moment of having to push yourself to the next step. It's like really hard to do. And it's not like I, I'm perfect at this by any means. Like, of course, I pick up the phone lots. But the more you train that mechanism of just being able to resist that impulsive side of you and like have discipline, the discipline just grows. And the better you get at that with your work, the more discipline you come with everything, food and friendships and everything. So it's an important thing. And our world is just so curated to not do that now and to constantly just, oh, I could go for that or that or that. There's just pleasure everywhere that could just alleviate the pain that we're going through. So really just bothering and realizing the pleasure is in the pursuit. You'll actually feel better. And then what else do we want in life but to feel good? That's why we're doing all this stuff. So, yeah, it's yeah, so true. I call it uh, surfing the urge. So like the urge comes nice. and just try and surf it and ride it out. And you can sometimes sit with the feeling or distract yourself with, more work or like more intention to what you're doing so like and every time you do that it's almost like a little win internally and as you say you build that you build that kind of discipline that sits with you for for future use as well definitely definitely and the dopamine's going up and we want it going up (laughs) yes tj i've learned a tremendous amount during this conversation it's certainly something i'm very passionate about and i'm very very glad we've been able to have the conversation if people would like to continue the conversation with you and i'm sure they will where should they head towards (laughs) Yeah, I've loved it, man. I've also learned a lot. So thank you for all your wisdom. Um, at TJ Power, I'm sure my name is somewhere on the on the screen, but at TJ Power, Instagram, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn, and soon to be YouTube. So yeah, Instagram is my best place at the moment. So head there. <laughs> yes, TJ, all of those will be linked in the show notes below. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. Please, if you're enjoying this one, share this one, your Instagram story, tag me at call.cambro and tag TJ, and I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.